Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a star on my review of The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins. So I'm reading this as a buddy read with Charles Heathcote. I will let you know right now, at the time of filming, I've only read the introduction. And this is going to be one of those ones because it's going to take me like a week to read it. So I tend to go through my tabs as I go along to make sure that I don't forget anything, you know. But I do have a few I want to share with you. Uh, before that, I'm going to read you the blurb. Uh, then I'll go through and check out some tabs. And then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So... Dane reads. When James Bond is forgotten, writes Anthony Burgess, Sergeant Cuff, the investigator of the Moonstone and father of all literary detectives, will shine as brightly as he did more than a hundred years ago. Wilkie Collins' story of the stolen gem, which has delighted millions of viewers on television, is even more exciting to read because of the way the plot is gradually unfolded through the mouths of different narrators, each of whom knows part of the story but none of whom knows all. Collins took elements of his story from real life. Sergeant Cuff from Sergeant Witcher of Scotland Yard, the clues of the stained garment and the laundry book from Constant Kent's murder of her younger brother. But in the fire of his imagination, the Moonstone became a gem of literature. So actually that's the case there that uh, the suspicions of Mr. Witcher was based on, uh, which I've read the book by Kate Summerscale not too long ago, and watched the, it was like a made-for-TV movie starring Paddy Considine, who's one of my favourite actors. I'd also like to point out Anthony Burgess, author of A Clockwork Orange in the introduction there. I mean, this was from 1967, I think, so I guess they had no way of knowing A, that the suspicions of Mr. Witcher would come out, and B, that James Bond was going to become such a successful franchise. Because I imagine, I mean, I have to check now, what's his name? Sergeant Cuff. If you ask people on the street, have you heard of Sergeant Cuff? They'll say no. And if you ask them, have you heard about James Bond? They'll say yes. So I don't know how well that comment has aged. Anyway, here in the introduction. While writing The Moonstone, Collins was in such physical pain that a succession of young men to whom he dictated the story gave up, unable to endure his cries and groans. The last part of The Moonstone was written largely under the effects of opium, and Collins told his friend Mary Anderson, when it was finished, I was not only pleased and astonished at the finale, but did not recognise it as my own. So I always enjoy seeing references to opium in literature. Um, but also, what that introduction doesn't point out is um, something I'm going to tell you I'm going to share with you in a minute, because I can give you more details. But yeah, so this is from the introduction from Anthony Burgess. The second source of the book is an event which took place in 1861, the notorious Road Murder. A girl named Constance Kent brutally murdered her young brother, and at her trial, following her confession four years after the crime, there were two main pieces of evidence, a blood-stained undergarment and a laundry book. Readers of the Moonstone will find no echo of the murder itself, but they will find a washing book and a nightdress stained with paint. They will also find, and this is very important, a police officer drawn from the man who investigated the road murder. Sergeant Cuff in the Moonstone is a fictionalised version of the real-life Sergeant Witcher. Scotland Yard has made its first entry into major British fiction. The entry may seem a little belated. The Moonstone was written in 1868 and the first and still greatest detective department had been established in 1842. Three inspectors and nine sergeants. But as though to commemorate some of the paint-fresh glamour of the new creation, Collins sets his novel in 1848 to 1849. Sergeant Cuff is in at the beginning, a man hired privately as the Bow Street Runners had been, but bearing the authority of a man whose master is the law, not his employer. Inspector Foley, who assisted Sergeant Witcher in the road case, appears in the Moonstone as Superintendent Seagrave. He is stupid and local, whereas Sergeant Cuff is metropolitan and clever, though not infallible. And yes, so we get here. Um, as for the physiological experiment, which comes near the end of the Moonstone, Collins knew, as he hints in his preface, exactly what he was writing about. He suffered all his life from rheumatic gout and, while he was working on the book, he was stricken with the worst attack of it that he had ever known. The agony was much exacerbated by worry over his mother's illness and grief over her death, yet, though often prostrate with pain, he kept on with his work. It was not easy for him to write, and he had to dictate to an amanuensis. In fact, several successive amanuenses, since none of them could stand to hear Colin's groans and cries of pain, and all of them had to leave. But finally a strong-minded young woman instructed that she must utterly disregard my suffering and attend solely to my words. Stuck out the task of taking down from dictation chapter after chapter of the Moonstone during the period of Colin's worst attacks. The need to concentrate on the intricacies of the story helped his agonies by day, but at night he had to take laudanum, a solution of opium in spirits of wine. The doses grew larger and larger and Collins may be said to have developed, like two other great English writers, Coleridge and De Quincey, an unbreakable addiction for the drug. Anyway, when he writes about the effects of opium, we can accept that experience, not imagination, is talking. 
Ah, so I misremembered because I thought they gave us this woman's name. I would love to know the woman who was badass enough to like stick at the job when all these dudes had failed, you know? Right, so we begin here with uh, the story first period. The loss of the diamond, 1848. The events related by Gabriel Betteridge, house steward in the service of Julia, Lady Verinda. And uh, right at the beginning we get, in the first part of Robinson Crusoe, at page 129, you will find it thus written. Now I saw, though too late, the folly of beginning a work before we count the cost, and before we judge rightly of our own strength to go through with it. And um, this character is really into Robinson Crusoe, which I thought was great because I really enjoyed Robinson Crusoe when I read it. And he actually says here, um, I am not superstitious. I have read a heap of books in my time. I am a scholar in my own way. Though turned 70, I possess an active memory and legs to correspond. You are not to take it, if you please, as the saying of an ignorant man, when I express my opinion that such a book as Robinson Crusoe never was written, and never will be written again. I have tried that book for years, generally in combination with a pipe of tobacco, and I have found it my friend in need in all the necessities of this mortal life. When my spirits are bad, Robinson Crusoe. When I want advice, Robinson Crusoe. In past times, when my wife plagued me. In present times, when I've had a drop too much, Robinson Crusoe. I have worn out six stout Robinson Crusoes with hard work in my service. On my lady's last birthday, she gave me a seventh. I took a drop too much on the strength of it, and Robinson Crusoe put me right again. Price four shillings and sixpence, bound in blue, with a picture into the bargain. So um, he, he references here the main, this character who's telling the narrative. He says, I agree with the late William Cobbett about picking a wife. See that she chews her food well and sets her foot down firmly on the ground when she walks. And you're all right. And he realises that it will be cheaper for him to marry someone than to keep uh, keep living with her and to keep hiring her as, as help, you know? And he says, I thought this was funny. Um, he talks about their their marriage, and I just think this is a great little description of what marriage is like. Not that I've ever been married, marriage, but he says, We were not a happy couple and not a miserable couple. We were six of one and half a dozen of the other. How it was, I don't understand, but we always seemed to be getting, with the best of motives, in one another's way. When I wanted to go upstairs, there was my wife coming down. Or when my wife wanted to go down, there was I coming up. That is married life, according to my experience of it. And I just thought this got a bit meta and I wondered if this is a kind of commentary on some of the problems that Collins himself faced. I wonder whether the gentlemen who make a business and a living out of writing books ever find their own selves getting in the way of their subjects like me. If they do, I can feel for them. I'd not realised this before, but it makes total sense that clairvoyance is a French word or phrase meaning something like the brightness of sight. This sentence hasn't aged well. It means something different now to when it was written, you know? So it says, if you happen to like dark women, who, I'm informed, have gone out of fashion latterly in the gay world, and if you have no particular prejudice in favour of size, I answer for Miss Rachel as one of the prettiest girls your eyes ever looked on. And another uh, phrase that hasn't <laughs> survived the test of time so well. Whether he had been trying to make love to his cousin again and had got a rebuff, or whether his broken rest night after night was aggravating the queer contradictions and uncertainties in his character, I don't know. So he's queer and making love to his cousin. Fair enough. I thought this was a great line here. It says, we had our breakfasts. Whatever happens in a house, robbery or murder, it doesn't matter, you must have your breakfast. Uh, we get a few lines like this as well, which show how the sort of societal attitudes towards women have changed. So we get the line, uh, a drop of tea is to a woman's tongue, what a drop of oil is to a wasting lamp. And he said, uh, when he's writing about Mrs. Holland, I translate Mrs. Yolland out of the Yorkshire language into the English language. When I tell you that the all-accomplished Cuff was every now and then puzzled to understand her until I helped him, you will draw your own conclusions as to what your state of mind would be if I reported her in a native tongue. I mean, Yorkshire isn't another language. They just talk like this, stuck. That was more brummy. How do they go? I'm going down to, well, and another one of these things that's again sort of shows the attitudes towards women. It is a maxim of mine that men, being superior creatures, are bound to improve women if they can. When a woman wants me to do anything, my daughter or not, it doesn't matter, I always insist on knowing why. The oftener you make them rummage their own minds for a reason, the more manageable you will find them in all the relations of life. It isn't their fault, poor wretches, that they act first and think afterwards. It's the fault of the fools who humour them. And then uh, Mr. Franklin. Um, he has this, this logic, he goes, um, he says, It is conceivable that man can have smoked as long as I have, without discovering that there is a complete system for the treatment of women at the bottom of his cigar case. Follow me carefully and I will prove it in two words. You choose a cigar, you try it, and it disappoints you. What do you do upon that? You throw it away and try another. Now observe the application. You choose a woman, you try her, and she breaks your heart. Fool, take a lesson from your cigar case. Throw her away and try another. I shook my head at that. Wonderfully clever, I dare say, but my own experience was dead against it. 
In the time of the late Mrs. Betteridge, I said, I felt pretty often inclined to try your philosophy, Mr. Franklin. But the law insists on your smoking your cigar, sir, when you have once chosen it. So we move on to um, the next narrative. Let's have a look. I'm gonna go to the, uh, where's the index? Oh my lord. Yeah, so the whole like hot first half of the book is the first period, the loss of the diamond. Uh, then we move on to the discovery of the truth, the events related in several narratives. Uh, the first narrative contributed by Miss Clack, niece of the late Sir John Verinda. She is annoying as hell. Um, she's super religious. Um, uh, and you'll see in a minute, but she has uh, this line, for example. Oh, be morally tidy. Let your faith be as your stockings and your stockings as your faith. Both ever spotless and both ready to put on at a moment's notice. We get the line, you would have done great things in my profession, ma'am, if you had happened to be a man. Right, so here's a little passage I'm going to read out to you, which explains why she's annoying. Basically, she keeps leaving these, like, religious tracts around everywhere, and it's super annoying. So, um... I slipped it under the sofa cushions half in and half out, close by a handkerchief and a smelling bottle. Every time her hand searched for either of those, it would touch the book, and sooner or later, who knows, the book might touch her. After making this arrangement, I thought it wise to withdraw. Let me leave you to repose, dear on. I will call again tomorrow. I looked accidentally towards the windows as I said that. It was full of flowers in boxes and pots. Lady Verinda was extravagantly fond of these perishable treasures and had a habit of rising every now and then and going to look at them and smell them. A new idea flashed across my mind. Oh, may I take a flower, I said, and got to the window unsuspected in that way. Instead of taking away a flower, I added one in the shape of another book from my bag, which I left to surprise my aunt among the geraniums and roses. The happy thought followed, why not do the same for her, poor dear, in every other room that she enters? I immediately said goodbye and crossing the hall slipped into the library. Samuel, coming up to let me out and supposing I had gone, went downstairs again. On the library table, I noticed two of the amusing books which the infidel doctor had recommended. I instantly covered them from sight with two of my own precious publications. In the breakfast room, I found my aunt's favourite canary singing in his cage. She was always in the habit of feeding the bird herself. Some groundsel was strewed on a table which stood immediately under the cage. I put a book among the groundsel. In the drawing room, I found more cheering opportunities of emptying my bag. My aunt's favourite musical pieces were on the piano. I slipped in two more books among the music. I disposed of another in the back drawing room, under some unfinished embroidery, which I knew to be of Lady Verinda's working. A third little room opened out of the back drawing room, from which it was shut off by curtains instead of a door. My aunt's plain old-fashioned fan was on the chimney piece. I opened my ninth book at a very special passage and put the fan in as a marker to keep the place. The question then came whether I should go higher still and try the bedroom floor, at the risk, undoubtedly, of being insulted if the person with the cap ribbons happened to be in the upper regions of the house and to find me out. But oh, what of that? It is a poor Christian that is afraid of being insulted. I went upstairs prepared for anything. All was silent and solitary. It was the servants' tea time, I suppose. My aunt's room was in front. The miniature of my late dear uncle, Sir John, hung on the wall opposite the bed. It seemed to smile at me and say, Drusilla, deposit a book. There were tables on either side of my aunt's bed. She was a bad sleeper and wanted, or thought she wanted, many things at night. I put a book near the matches on one side and a book under the box of chocolate drops on the other. Whether she wanted a light or whether she wanted a drop, there was a precious publication to meet her eye or to meet her hand, and to say with silent eloquence in either case, Come, try me, try me. But one book was now left at the bottom of my bag, and but one apartment was still unexplored. The bathroom, which opened out of the bedroom. I peeped in, and the holy inner voice that never deceives whispered to me, You have met her, Drusilla, everywhere else. Meet her at the bath, and the work is done. I observed a dressing gown thrown across a chair. It had a pocket in it, and in that pocket I put my last book. Can words express my exquisite sense of duty done when I had slipped out of the house, unsuspected by any of them, and when I found myself in the street with my empty bag under my arm? All oh, my worldly friends, pursuing the phantom pleasure through the guilty mazes of dissipation, how easy it is to be happy if you will only be good. I hate this woman. This is exactly the reason why I hate organised religion. <laughs> Luckily, her aunt finds them and just sends them all back to her in the post. See, what I would have done, I would have just burned them, or put them in a bin or something. You know? Because I think this is what these people rely on. They rely on the idea that you're going to be too polite to just get rid of them. And you should, in fact, just get rid of them. And again, just this uh, religion, man. So uh, taxation may be the consequence of a mission. Riots may be the consequence of a mission. Wars may be the consequence of a mission. We go on with our work, irrespective of every human consideration which moves the world outside us. We are above reason. We are beyond ridicule. We see with nobody's eyes, we hear with nobody's ears, we feel with nobody's hearts, but our own glorious, glorious privilege. Yes, what a privilege to cause wars in the name of your shitty God. 
Great line here. Successful love may sometimes use the language of flattery, I admit, but hopeless love, dearest, always speaks the truth. And so later on we move uh, to the uh, testimonial of a lawyer. And I thought this was funny because I wish more people would do this. It says, I am bound to testify that he was the perfect model of a client. He might not have respected my life, but he did what none of my own countrymen had ever done in all my experience of them. He respected my time. So there's a, a phrase, uh, a saying that's referred to nothing venture, nothing have which I guess has now evolved to nothing ventured, nothing gained, which I've got to say I prefer, it makes more sense. I like this little line as well. We often hear, almost invariably, however, from superficial observers, that guilt can look like innocence. I believe it to be infinitely the truer axiom of the two that innocence can look like guilt. I suppose they're both true. And then somebody basically is gathering his bravery and he says he roused his manhood, which to me just sounds like he's got an erection. A great quote here that I relate it to, because I am definitely of the latter ilk here. Some men have a knack of keeping appointments, and other men have a knack of missing them. Yep, definitely the latter. And we get a line here. It's only in the books that the officers of the detective force are superior to the weakness of making a mistake. But I was under the impression this was always touted as being like the first detective novel. So, what books? Especially because this is set before this book was even published as well. And again, bearing in mind this was published in uh, the 18th century, in about 1864, I want to say. Let's have a look. 1868. Um, we get this line that's even truer today, like way truer today. In our modern system of civilization, celebrity, no matter of what kind, is the lever that will move anything. So yeah, The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, all in all, did enjoy this read. I'd probably give it like a 3.5 out of 5, fairly middle of the road. Um, yeah, it was. It, it took a while, it took some sort of dedication to go through it, but it was a good little read. Um, it has now made me want to read The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins as well, even though I think Charlie hated that one. And I am yet to see how Charlie felt about this one. He has posted a video, which I'll link to below, called Nosy Parker Reads Classic Detective Novel, so we shall see. Um, but also, if you're into the detective genre, this is really one you should read just because of how influential it was. But as I say, it's actually a pretty good read in its own right as well, so check it out. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.